Dusan. How, how are you? I am Monique Dusan. Welcome to All the Things, the show where we talk about all, all the, the things. things. That's right. Related to God, the Bible, and life. That's right. Yes, I am Monique Dusan, and I am not famous. But I am here with someone who is famous. Her name is Krista Bontrager. Not famous. No. Also known as Theology Mom. Everywhere, all over the world, social and social media. And you're on social media now. <gasps> yes, I finally have a Twitter account. The big announcement, the big yes, reveal. It is. It in. What is it? It's the real Monique D. Yes, you can find me everywhere on Twitter. Twitter anyway, yeah. everywhere on Twitter as the real Monique D. I have not made a Twitter post yet. I really don't understand Twitter. It just seems a little suspect. <laughs> So well, we'll, we'll get you in the groove, the Twitter the, uh, universe, as I like to call it. Yeah, it's not to tweet and, you know, you know Twitter just, I'm going to ease my way in. Okay. Much better on Facebook. All right. Sometimes. Okay. Well, welcome to All The Things. Today, we are going to be talking about Easter. A little bit of post-Easter cleanup. Yeah, yeah. yeah, some Easter thoughts and... The sinner's prayer. Yeah, which we heard in church last week. Yes, and I'm sure all of you heard it in church as well. (laughs) At least, you know, if you went to the church like mine. Um, And then we're going to talk about singles in the church. That seems especially relevant to your life. I am single, yes. I haven't been single since the first George Bush was president. I was a young child when the first George Bush was president. (laughs) Fantastic. Yeah. So we can talk about that. All right. Um, But I have been single a while and singleness in church is a very, again, suspect situation. You have some opinions about that. I have a lot of opinions about that. But in the meantime, make sure to join us in our live chat. Post your questions or thoughts there and we will make sure to respond. Yeah, we're um, monitoring the live chat ourselves. So we're trying to juggle a lot of things my daughter Abby is usually over over there. Yes. Monitoring the live chat. Way. But she went to party. Yeah, her chair is empty there. It's all very sad. Womp womp. But she went with her friend down the street to the the Lemon Festival that's here in town. So uh, we're on our own. So hopefully we can monitor everything. And I already see my friend Kenny Rhodes is in there. Hopefully he doesn't ask me anything too complicated. If he does, I'm going to have to like throw it over to Monique to to answer i am a very simple person i just want everyone to know <laughs> all of the scholarly questions ta-da, yeah right there yeah all right but all let's right. get going yeah so let's get things rolling here let's talk a little bit about easter i i learned something new on easter i i learned a new expression as well did i okay so i'm on twitter since we were just talking about mm-hmm. that and i see um a, a fairly famous African-American, evangelical, Christian um, leader, speaker, yeah. author, person. And she says, um, I'm putting Vaseline on the kid's face because he got up. And I'm like, I have no idea what this tweet is about. So I had to come to my friendly neighborhood black friend to explain to me what is this tweet I'm not the only saying. one, just in case people are wondering. Yeah. But I am You're the, the one, one closest who, to you. Yeah, that's right. Yes. <laughs> At that moment, I was the one closest to you. Yeah. And yes, so... he. What is this? What, he what's the up. deal with Vaseline and what's the deal with he got up? Well, Vaseline is a whole other story on its own. We will talk about the he got up. Okay. Okay. He got up. He rose from the dead. Okay. There's actually a song that says, you got up so I can get up again. I don't and know that song. Yes, I believe it is Travis Green. Okay. And it's a good song. I like it because it's true. Like, he got up and it enables me to continue to get up. So it's a reference to the resurrection. Yes. Okay. Yes. He got up. He got up. Yes. I realized that you don't say he got up. No. I've That's never okay. heard this But expression. what you do say is he is risen. He is risen indeed. Three times. <laughs> I don't know anything about this. You've never heard that expression. Maybe I have not been going to the most holy of churches. I don't know. Maybe my churches I've been in have been suspect. But I have not heard this. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Keep going. Yeah. Why, why three times? So, yeah, well, I would imagine one for each member of the Trinity. I don't know. but Okay. <laughs> that, there's that. But uh, you and I went to a sunrise service. 
first. And, yes. and they did that routine of he is risen, he is risen indeed. And then we went to our regular church. Mm-hmm. Same deal. Yes. So it was a little bit of a learning experience for you. Next week's going to be my turn to go to black church. Yes, I cannot we, wait. We, we I'm so excited. We should have a full report on that we next should. week. <laughs> I am so excited. I have not been in like a full, like just all black service in years and i am so excited to go i hope they have like the ushers with the nursing hats and i had no idea what that was tambourines i just i i probably shouldn't clap in front of the microphone i am excited about this yeah so we'll report on all the things all the things next week yeah okay cool yeah we can do that but in the meantime let's get going about the sinner's prayer all right so on easter both services we went to everyone was giving the salvation call and and I'm like, that's great. Like inviting people into a personal relationship with Jesus is awesome. And there's also a way in which it's done, which I think I've only seen it done that way. And then we got going on a conversation a few days ago yesterday on the sinner's prayer itself. Yeah. And that just led me to thinking, I, I, yeah, I've, I've had some thoughts about it before, but is it really biblical for us to do the sinner's prayer? Like, I didn't see the disciples saying, hey, Jesus, can you come into my heart? <laughs> I, yeah. You know, where do we or, even get that idea? Or yeah. Paul even saying, you know, in the process of conversion, saying, hey, this is how you are saved. Ask Jesus into your heart. Right. So I was just wondering if we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think it's a good topic worthy of conversation. And if Kenny's still on the line, you can chime in here um, as a as a pastor. But, you know, I think. You're right to notice that the phraseology of ask Jesus into your heart, make him Savior and Lord is not like there's no Bible verse I can go to that uses that phrase. It it really is an American Christian 20th century type of expression. And that doesn't make it wrong or bad or immoral. It's just let's just be clear about, you know, the biblical phraseology for salvation is quite a bit different than that. So it's important to know. And and when we look at the new Testament, it's more about bringing the kingdom of God near. It's about repentance. It's about forgiveness. It's about um, being in Christ, being a member of the family of God. Um, These are more of the biblical expressions for our faith. And so, but as American Christians, we've kind of adopted this, this phraseology of accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior yeah. into our heart. Yeah. So then if that is more of an adopted kind of or a mm, yeah, adopted version of what the original intent was, what were the original steps and why do you think we've gotten so far away from what it was originally? That's an interesting question. Um, I think what the sinner's prayer does is that it highly simplifies what we call conversion. You know, like there's the, in Christianity, there's a concept of a before and an after of before I met Christ, I was this after I met Christ, I was this. And there's that moment in time where we step through that threshold and we're not always, not everybody is as consciously aware of it in the same level. Like, I think a child who steps over that threshold may or may not be as aware as um, someone who's a criminal and comes to faith in prison. I mean, or as an adult, I mean, there's different levels of awareness, but there's some point at which we cross that threshold of before and after the sinner's prayer is like kind of this highly simplified way of doing that, of pray after me. Um, There's almost this, I, I like to call it like an appeal to Christian magic of say these magical words mm. and then you'll be saved. If you just repeat after me, you say this magical prayer. It's almost like we're having people do this incantation and then they will be saved. We don't really see that structure in, in the New Testament or in the early church in the first three to four hundred years of church history. What we see rather is like in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, the people ask Peter, what must I do to be saved? And he says, repent of your sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get water baptized. 
And then there's kind of a, a fourth component that we see in, in Acts is receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, we see all four of these play out in the book of Acts at different times and in different ways, but they're all, they're all words that are used for stepping through that threshold of before and after. And in the, if you're an adult convert to a church, even today, to Orthodox faith or Roman Catholic faith, there is, there is conversion is thought of as including these four pieces or these four components of repent, believe, water baptism, and receiving the Holy Spirit. And so it's a very ancient tradition, but what the sinner's prayer does is it just kind of lops off three of those things and it just says, believe that that's, that's all you need. And then we we've, we've made baptism sort of optional, but we could, we can talk about that if you want, but that's a whole other rant. <laughs> I can see that. Um, I think, and you, you should really see how I do the center spirit with children. Well, I would like um, to hear it. You should tell us. Well, share from a pastoral think, perspective as a children's pastor. I think part of it is talking about the idea of sin and that we've all done wrong and the separation that sin causes between us and God and the idea of repentance and what does it mean to repent and not just to say, I'm sorry, but to turn away from it and how Jesus helps us and Holy Spirit helps us to walk that out and that it is a daily road and we will mess up. And, um, you know, like, but, but that doesn't mean just because we mess up that we are no longer in relationship yeah. with Jesus. Um, also, I think that it's important to to let children know, and I, I'm just talking about my experience with children because I've never really led an adult to the Lord. That might be a problem, but, you know. We can um, talk about talk that. About, talk about that on another show. <laughs> um, the idea that they are, like, walking a, a long road with the Lord. Yeah. And so I will, in addition to calling him their savior, we will call him their forever friend. Mm -hmm. and that he is going to, he's with you forever. Like he is that best friend that you can talk to, that you can go to, that will help you. Like who is your best friend? Does your best friend help you? Yes. Okay. So imagine like a friend even better than that. Well, and Jesus says to his own disciples toward the end of his ministry, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. I mean, that is a biblical concept. Mm -hmm. And that that is kind of cool. I like that because it it gives the right... Um, picture in terms of the Christian life is a journey. And I think that that's something that the sinner's prayer doesn't really address that when you walk into a Christian faith, you're walking into a new life and a new journey and that Christianity involves walking and falling down and going backwards sometimes and going to the top of a mountain and looking and enjoying the view and, and going in the valley, I think there's a reason why walking is such a metaphor for the Christian life. As Eugene Peterson um, said, it's a long obedience in the same direction. Yeah. And sometimes we fall down and sometimes we do better than others, but there's a trajectory over time of growth and more submission to the Lord and, and learning more about his love and how we display that love. But that that takes time. And I think that the the potential pitfall of the sinner's prayer is it gives an impression. I think sometimes if just say these magic words and then your life is going to magically yes. get better. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, the thing is, is that um, there will be a, a long road ahead potentially. And I think that repentance is, is one of the most overlooked and under preached themes in the American church today. Um we don't teach people or talk about turning away from their sin as being part of walking through that threshold that the life I had before I'm no longer going to live and I'm going to walk into the desires of what God has for me. It's a new life. It's a new beginning. Um, our tendency is to focus more on the forgiveness but not to explain the repentance component. I've never heard somebody talk about the sinner's prayer and include repentance. Hmm, I've only ever heard them talk about forgiveness. 
But I think repentance is absolutely critical, and you see that throughout the Gospels and Acts. So, anyways, those are just some of my thoughts about it. Now, I have one more question in sure. relation to this. Um, what do you say to the person who's like, well, I want to be a Christian, but now you're telling me I have to repent, and oh, then I have to question. believe, and then I have to be baptized, and then I have to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and can't I just be a Christian? Yeah. Or, like, if, if all of these steps aren't fulfilled, what am I? Yeah, that's a great question. It's sort of a version of the thief on the cross question of what do I make about the thief on the cross? He was never water baptized. You know, he didn't receive the Holy Spirit the way that they did on Pentecost. What do we do there? Does is that mean that they're just only for um, belief is necessary? So, you know, he wouldn't have had time to repent because he was on the cross. Oh, there's that one. <laughs> yeah. So I think, um, I think what's, important to think about in that scenario is that God's not going to be so legalistic about things that if people have a deathbed conversion or they're in some extenuating circumstance where those things aren't available or aren't presented to them, he's not such a legalist that he's not going to get that person saved. Um, But I think that as Christian leaders, It's important for us to be straight about what we are presenting as the entrance or the threshold into our faith. Now, I think the there there's a balance between the two needs. Historically, in the early church, like after the apostles, um, conversion was like this long process of catechesis, of learning and, and being a student. And that's one end of the spectrum where conversion can take you like a year to go through a conversion class and getting Mm -hmm. baptized and everything. But then on the other end of the spectrum is kind of what we experienced on Sunday, where we're going to say the sinner's prayer and get all these people saved in five minutes. I like to try to think of a, of a balance between the two. Like ours, are there instances where you're in a street situation and you're sharing the Lord, the Lord prompts you to go over to a homeless person and share the gospel with them, and then they make a profession of faith right there on the spot. I'm not going to be such a legalist as to say, well, hey, it doesn't count unless you get water baptized. You know, the Lord will sort that out. Maybe if I have a bottle of water, I ask him if he wants to be baptized there on the spot, I can pour some water on him. I don't know. That would be a great conversation with the Lord of what do you want me to do about that? But um, I don't, I want to allow for those situations, like with the Ethiopian eunuch where he says, Is there anything stopping me from being baptized right now? Pull the chariot over. There's some water. Let's go. You know, I want to allow for that spontaneous expression of faith. But at the same time, I don't want to hurry people along where I kind of turn it into a magical prayer and I'm not properly educating people either. So there's, there's that balance of, of wanting to hit that. So, so a balance between like, don't wait seven years before you're baptized or, Don't bust into your neighbor's house unannounced yeah. and put them in their bathtub. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I so, think I think we're clear. Yeah. All right. So let's move on. Next thing. Yeah, I see it. I'm reading it right now. From our friend Juwad, oh. is, our Muslim friend, is weighing in. And he says, as a Muslim, uh, can I get my sins atoned and reach salvation without believing in Jesus as God, but rather as a prophet only? Please, sisters, I want an honest answer, no political correctness. Well, Juad, we know that you like honest answers and we appreciate always your graciousness yes. and hello, patience hello. with us. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, in uh, There's a few places in the Gospels and in um, the book of Acts, which is the book of Acts, Juad, if you're new to the scripture, is is kind of the early start of, of, the, of Christianity. And it's about our history as Christians. And again, Ju, I don't want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, to just start reading the Gospels. It will might make more sense to you if you if you start going through the Gospels mm-hmm. yourselves. Um, you know, I, I've uh, you might consider uh, the Gospel of Matthew or of Mark. Those are those might be good places for you to start. But anyways, on your question, um, when Jesus comes, what he says about himself in the Gospel of John is he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I think that's a very important statement because he's telling the Jewish people, look, if you want to go to the Father, if you want to access 
the father. This is how you do it. You have to come through me. He is the sacrifice. His is the blood. His is the priesthood. His is the temple that we must go through. And so that in a Christian, in the Christian religion, we would say that you, you need to go through Jesus. Jesus. Um, there's a very similar statement to that in the early chapters of Acts. I think it might be in Acts chapter four that where the, the apostles are on trial and the Jewish leaders are trying to get them to say that Jesus was just a prophet. And they say, no, you know, that, that we must speak and heal in the name of Jesus because he's more than a prophet. You know, he, he is God. And so we would say that, that trusting in Jesus as your savior is, is saying that he is more than a prophet. Um, and so that would be a very important difference or distinction between the Christian worldview and the religion of Islam. And we say that with all, all due respect, we're just, it's, it's not a condemnation about you personally. We're just simply pointing out the differences, differences. Um, in, in our belief systems. And so, but we leave that to you to, to wrestle through. And, and again, we would encourage you Islam. Um, I know that Islam believes that in the Bible, but that also believes that the, the scriptures, the Bible have, has been corrupted. Mm -hmm. But you might just go read them for yourselves and try it on and, and see what happens and see, you know, what that is for you and to determine for yourself what's there. So, yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Great question. Yeah, great question. Um, so singleness in the church. Are we going to talk about that now? We are. We're going to talk about that. And I'm going to remove an eyelash from my <laughs> eye. Excuse me, everyone, while I just, you know. Um, yes, we're going to talk about singleness in the church. So I am single. I have been single a while. You have not been single for the last like four presidencies. Yeah, <laughs> there's that. A long time. Um, and that's OK. Um, how long have you been married? Twenty six years. Twenty six years. That's so, awesome. Going strong. Yay. Um, I have been single about the same amount of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me stop. Um, OK. I I'm going to I'm going to come from my own personal sure. views. Yeah. I think that the church many churches fail miserably when it comes to dealing with singles and especially dealing with older singles. I am of Like singles that aren't 22. Yes, singles okay. who aren't 21, 22 yeah. like at the end of the college career. I've been sure. single a while. I'm of an undisclosed age, <laughs> but it's there. Um and it, when I've signed up, like, to join a small group or something like that, and I'm choosing, like, a single small group, everyone there, it's like, I'm, it's early 20s. And there's nothing wrong with being in your early 20s. They That's just fine. group you together according yes. to your marriage status. Yes. Yeah. So okay. because my, my, my ring <laughs> isn't there yet on my finger, then I go with, it's kind of like being put in the play group or sitting at the, the kids table. When you're uh, 21. Yes. <laughs> okay. And, and that's, there is a time and place and that's fine. I also think that there are seasons of life and, if you're not wondering how to write a resume, I literally had someone ask me how to write a resume in one of the small groups. And I was like, oh, because okay. they're starting their job search. Yes. They're in that season. I've been working for a season yeah. already. And so a few seasons, a few. <laughs> I'm wondering, what are your thoughts about singleness? And and maybe you don't have any because you haven't been single in a very long. You were married at what? Twenty two. Yeah. So to the tail end of twenty two. Yeah. Twenty three. Yeah. Um, so with that, I am I'm kind of surprised and disappointed that it doesn't feel more like a family like what what are we doing as yeah. the church i think our i think we need some some work on our theology of singleness i, I would like to point out that jesus was single hmm. and so he was fully fulfilled as a human person and i would say as a man even though he was single and i think that informs us in some ways that being single doesn't mean being less than you, that you can still walk in the fullness of your call in your spiritual gifts, in the power 
and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ as, as his disciple, all of those things are fully available to you as a single person because they were fully available to Jesus. Yeah. I, I also think that in that married people, we don't always do a great job of communicating that message to our single friends because we're so busy trying to fix them up. Let me fix your life. What you really need is to get married. That is such the word. Yeah. Like, or well, why, why aren't you married? What's wrong with you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Yeah. You know, like, I, and I've done a lot of, cool. I think, I think I've done cool things. I've lived in South Africa for, you know, four and a half years. I've done a lot of stuff with kids. And yet when I walk into a church, all of that, or when I have conversations with certain people in church, it's always, that's great. But honey, when are you going to settle down? Yeah. When are you getting married? Yes. Get yourself together. Yeah. I literally had someone tell me, God bless her, you know, we're not going to feed you this because you should be getting married soon. I should. Like there's there's a should, an expectation. Yes. And we need to make sure that you are ready because you need to, like you need to do this. Your singleness must have a logical explanation. Like, what are you doing wrong? Are yes. you turning men off? Like, yes. what's your issue? Yes. Yeah. Is your personality too strong? Yeah. <laughs> what's going on? And I think that that is a fair comment that as a community, as our faith community, as a local church, it the life of many local churches is designed with the family in mind. And so we almost don't even know what to do with single people and I think that this is because, in large measure, we don't have a robust theology of singleness. Well, if the fam, if church is built with the family in mind, where do I fit in exactly. the family? Am I like a step cousin? <laughs> Am I like you know that person? I f- sometimes you feel like the person who caused your parents to divorce. Like we don't really want to talk to you. You're not really accepted here. <laughs> <laughs> you know it, and I'm in all honesty, like it's painful because. It, You'll have like family nights. Yeah. Well, I'm not a family, you know? Does this include me? Yes. Well, and I think that earlier you hinted on a concept is you wish, you you kind of have a longing of wishing the local church was more like a family. And Mm. I think that's a, that's a real longing. I think that that's legitimate. I mean, in the early church, one of the primary um, word pictures that scripture gives us about the church is that we are a family. We're a spiritual family. We're also a temple. I mean, we're we're a holy nation. We're a royal priesthood. There, it, there's a number of word pictures, but one of the more dominant ones is that we're a family. And the father has adopted us as his children. And it's like Jesus is our big brother. We're co-heirs with him. We will co-reign with Jesus in the new creation. Um And so when we think about each other, uh, through the blood of Jesus, something has happened in the spirit realm when we put our faith and trust in Jesus as as our Savior, that we walk through that threshold. Something happens to us in the supernatural realm where we get connected. Mm -hmm. We become not just friends. We become sisters in the Lord. Something meaningful happens between us, and we become um, in first Corinthians, it talks about the body, you know, and, and I think in some sense we send messages sometimes overtly, uh, sometimes more subtly that single people are like this part of the body that we want to forget about, you know, that we don't want to crooked baby toe, (laughs) the crooked baby toe. There it is. (laughs) So we, we don't want to do that. We want to do better. And I think that the, the most important starting point is knowing that Jesus was single and he was fully human and he was able to fully walk in his anointing. And, and that even is even that though. I hear that so many times. Like you, you hold out. Jesus was fully single. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was single, but yet he was fully human and he was fully God. And I think that that's great. And I'm just going to be real. I'm like, that's good. But yes, he was fully God. <laughs> I am not like, let's just be real. I am not fully God. I am all human all the time. And while that's, it is an encouragement to be like, you know, Jesus really, he did it, but that's great. But 
you're still married. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it's 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 there. It's com- it's completely different to be able to encourage someone from your married place. I think then being able to say, hey, look, I've walked this road. I wish that churches would have mm. people who who were older when they got married and say, hey, I've walked this road. You can do this because I did it. Not because yeah. Jesus did it, who was fully God. Of course he did it. He also said that he could call down angels. Well, I'm trying to you know, work my way up there. Yeah, but there is that that thought in the book of Hebrews about Jesus being tempted in every way that we are. And that's how he identifies with us. And I think that it's important not to cast that aside too quickly there. <laughs> but I do think you raise an important point. That, and our friend Amanda is, uh, is asking, do you think uh, affinity groups in general serve the larger body well when it comes to small groups? I'm not sure I know what an affinity group is. I've never heard that term. I'm guessing it means like small groups according to life stage or um, your common interest or something. And I think that's an important point because one of the things I think is lost in the American churches who use small groups, I can't speak for how it is overseas. You'd be more in a position to speak to that. But for a lot of the time we've lost the intergenerational component of small groups because we do have a tendency to organize people according to life stage. Mm-hmm. You know, the c- young couples with young children, you go over here together. College students, you go over here. Older people, you go over here. Uh, women, you go over here. Men, you go over here. And we tend to group each other kind of according to like like stages or like life seasons. Um, I think that, uh, I think that it's, important to understand that these the intergenerational component in many cases is being sacrificed and that was a vital part of the early church is having feedback and that brings me back to the family component earlier like how would your life have benefited and this is a real question not rhetorical if you had had some older more mature christians in your in your life group that had lived a lot of living with the Lord and how that could have encouraged you, how that could have poured into you, provided an example for you. I think many people who come out of rough family situations, maybe they're victims of abuse and then they become Christians and they need like some positive role models. They need friendships. Mm -hmm. Um, They need some, some people who have lived longer than them in the Lord to give them some wisdom but are we short circuiting that by grouping everyone according to their life stage? I agree. I think um, in in yeah, in answer to that, coming out of a single parent home, knowing not knowing many older men as I started walking with the Lord, and even now, you know, not knowing a lot of like father figure type men my relationship with the Lord for a long time was really like, I'm not really sure how to relate to you as father. And I think it was just because it was never modeled for me. I didn't really get to see that. Um, And now like having some men in my life where I'm like, oh, okay, I can see this or I can, you know, relate to the Lord as this because I can see the tangible aspect of that. I think that's important. I think that in intergenerational groups, you get to see grandparents, you get to see, um, fathers, you get to see mothers and in, in husbands and forms. wives. Yeah. yeah. Husbands and wives. Um, I mean, cousins, you know, like, you know, you're not my sister quite yet, but you're not like my cousin, you know? <laughs> um, but no, I think that we have a long way to go a little bit. In, in yeah. That. And I think that this is a good conversation because it sparks my thinking ab- about this issue. And Um, it's a blind spot for me. I mean, you're kind of poking fun of me, but you're absolutely right is that it is a blind spot for me because it's not my concern and it Mm -hmm. hasn't been my concern for a very long time. And I think that sometimes that happens to us is that when something's not immediately in front of our face, we don't always pay attention to it. But as a single person who's in my life and very important to me, it's made me kind of pay attention to it more like, okay, this isn't something I've thought much about. What messages do we send? How can my family 
help support you yeah. in your journey and providing that kind of intergenerational component. I don't know. Is it okay to tell people that, that you live with us? Yeah. <laughs> and if it wasn't, we already have. Yeah. No. yeah, no, it's fine. Um, one of the things that I appreciate about our friendship is that we do talk about my singleness and what are the, like we were talking this morning, what are the appropriate ways, you know, of finding a spouse or just finding a friend, you know, yeah. and what, what does that look like? And what does the Bible say about your mate yeah. and how should I respond to that? And it's not just like some cattle call or, you know, am I standing in a way that, um, that's different than how the world tells me to stand. Well, and I think that part of that is opening up. I guess I'm I, one thing I've learned through our friendship is how to open and risk and open my heart wider, you know, because there's there's people out there that that need friends. You know, they need connection and we've been created for connection. And that's part of the created order is that it's not good for people to be alone. Mm -hmm. But what do you do when you're an adult who's a single mm -hmm. and you're feeling very much alone? Like, yeah. how do you be in that journey? And I want to encourage people like think of singles in your faith communities who need a place to go. They need an invitation on the holidays. They need someone to invite them to Sunday dinner. Um, and they might even be people that are invisible to you now, mm -hmm. but you need the Lord to highlight them to you because yes. they might need a family. Maybe they've come from an abusive situation. Maybe they've come, maybe they were products of the foster care system and they don't have healthy family role models and they need someone to just sort of quasi adopt them mm -hmm. into their family situation and say, you know, we're going to include you. We're going to love you. Yeah. We're going to invite you in. Um, hospitality and invitation is an extremely huge Christian value that I think we have eclipsed yeah. in well, some measure. And maybe they're in their forties and just haven't found that person. Yeah. I think that's as big as, yeah. you know, the, the ideas that you gave as well. Like maybe that it's just a person who, or maybe they've chosen that, yeah. you know, this isn't the or road. Maybe that they're I a young about. widow or yeah. it could be all kind of life situations, but people need inclusion. They need, they need that. And, especially if you notice somebody who's really troubled, yeah. you know, if you have a strong family, invite, invite that person in yeah. and um, just be yourself. And, and you have no idea what an impact that can have I agree. on someone else. Yes, so. but hone it down for the singles. Singles. I see you. I see you singles. <laughs> okay. We have another question from our friend Juwad. I love it. Um, it says, I have been struggling with God having a son concept. It is a very new concept to me. We have been told as Muslims that God is a very abstract entity. So he cannot be like us as humans. That's what are such your a great, on that? that's a great question, Juad. And I know that mm -hmm. that is a very, very common question of uh, Muslims. And it's a common point of confusion between the religion of Islam and Christianity. And I know it can be a stumbling block. So I really appreciate the, um, the humility and the graciousness in, in you just asking yeah. the question. And you know what, to be honest, um, I don't know if I can answer that question from the angle of somebody who's a Muslim and asking it. Um, it's not something that I've researched into what the issues are behind that question for you or what they might be. But what I can tell you is that one of the distinctive features of uh, the Christian religion is that we are too, we share in common with, with Muslims that we are both what's called monotheistic religions. Um, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all believe in one God, and that's called monotheism. Polytheism is believing in many gods. Um, Christianity believes also in the a concept of the Trinity, which I know can be very confusing to many uh, Muslims. So I'm going to do my best to try to explain this very critical doctrine, because this is in a way the core of what it means to be a Christian is, is the Trinity. So the Trinity, and we believe in one God, not three gods. That's a common point of confusion. We're not tritheists. We don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God in three persons. And so there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Now, some Muslims I know are very confused about the Virgin Mary, who is Jesus's mother. She's not part of the Trinity, um, but it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so, again, we believe one God in three persons. Another way of thinking about this is we believe in one who and three what's. So it's not a logical contradiction. It's it's two different categories of things. Okay. Now I know that it's very hard for us to picture this because in our world, it's hard for us to think about what's something that could be one and three at the same time. So Christians have historically engaged in word pictures to sometimes try to explain this idea. Um, so you might think of it as, um, and all of these picture, word pictures break down at some point in the analogy, but we're just going to use a few of them mm -hmm. just to try to explain. Um, there's three forms of water. There's ice, there's steam, and there's the liquid water. They're all water, but it's three states of water. So it's one what with three states. Um, we might think of an apple that there's the skin, there's the meat of the apple, and then there's the seeds. It's three components, but all of them make up the one apple. Now, all of these have problems, but I'm just, again, trying to help you begin to understand the concept of the Trinity. Now, when we think about the concept of God having a son, I really appreciate how you said that it's a new concept for you. Anytime I run into a new concept, my mind needs some time to warm up to it. Yes. So when Jesus came, and this is, again, I'm going to encourage you to read the Gospels. When Jesus cl came, he claimed to be the Son of God. That's not a, a title that Christians invented after the fact. That's a title that Jesus used. And he did things to prove that he was God. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. He controlled the weather. Those are things that only God can do as the creator. But he also did things that only he, that humans can do. God is a spirit, so he doesn't need to eat food. Mm -hmm. But Jesus ate food. He got hungry. He slept. He had emotions. He cried. He got tired. So he, he shows us in the gospels that he is this unique person that he comes. He's fully God and he's fully human. And I would say he's also fully man as Jesus, because he came in the form of a male person. So I understand it's a new concept for you, and I'm just explaining what the Christian view of it is. And I'm sure you have a thousand more questions, and that's okay. And um, maybe what I'm going to do, Juad, if it's okay with you, is when I post the, um, the description for this video after we get off the air, I'll try to find a couple of videos from, from others who might be coming from a per perspective of former Muslims who are now Christians, and they might be more adept at explaining this mm -hmm. to you in a way that you can kind of relate to um, coming out of that perspective. Okay. So awesome question though. I love yes, that. Always come in with awesome questions. Yeah, Keep them coming. And, uh, can I just uh, add something here? Sure. Go ahead. Here. Um, you can turn on your camera. Yeah, there, there you are. Uh, uh, in Genesis, well, he ends his question by saying uh, he's been taught that uh, God is a very abstract entity, so it cannot be like us humans. But uh, in Genesis, uh, he creates us in his image. And so a lot of the attributes we have come from God. And so in that aspect, we, we do have some qualities that are similar to God. Now, do the Muslims believe in the... Um, Book of Genesis is—is is that something that they? Yeah, I think I think that they they honor the Bible. They would just say that it's been corrupted, but they still honor it and see it as as a holy book. Yeah. Is is my understanding? Okay. So, cool. um, but awesome question and glad for for Bob for jumping in there. So, that's cool. Um, I, all right, I won't go there. I was thinking about bringing something else up, but I won't go there. All so, right. I was just having a little conversation with the Holy Spirit about that. It was just like, oh, no, no, not quite. All right. Okay. That's good. <laughs> wow. We're going to start and wrap up. Yeah. Um, you have some new teachings coming out on your website and your podcast, your YouTube yeah. channel. Yeah. 
So in addition to doing the weekly live stream, um, which is awesome, I'm having so much fun. Do you guys enjoy having Monique? be the lead tonight it's a little different i'll yeah. tell you that we practiced it yesterday and i was like yes i can do this today i'm like you know oh i um, thought you did a great uh, job i don't know I, I think you did a great job what do you think bob oh yeah yeah You're yeah doing great all right good. awesome job yeah so i i loved it but in addition to doing this show every week i also have several hundred um teachings on my youtube channel and i am starting kind of an a new series of teachings. I just wrapped up adding some videos uh, related to women and gender issues. Now I'm doing uh, starting a new series on of conversations related to race issues. Yes. So that's going to be fun. That is going to be extremely fun. <laughs> so I've got a new one releasing on Tuesday. So I'm trying to post them every Tuesday. I've got one up there right now. It's going to release on Tuesday at four o'clock Pacific. So if people want to Go on YouTube, subscribe to my channel, set a reminder. There's a little button you can click that it'll YouTube will send you a reminder when it's released and you can check that out. But it's going to it's a really cool video where I'm doing a reflection on Acts chapter eight and the Ethiopian eunuch and this pivotal moment in the history of redemption that I don't think we talk about nearly enough. And that is the role of. Africans in the history of the early church. Yes, I, I can approve of that yes. message. I do approve of this. Yeah. Um, I, for me, I think it's important because many people would say that Christianity is a white man's religion and that is not true. That's right. That is just, it's a complete, it's just not historically lie. accurate. Yeah. yeah. So just giving people a little bit of a glimpse into that using Acts chapter eight. So, yeah. Um, so I think that that's really important and I appreciate conversations of race and yeah. ethnicity and all really? of those things. Yeah. You know, you might not know. <laughs> you black. I, that's true. Sometimes <laughs> once in a while um, or every day, every day, 24 hours a day. That's right. And so, yeah, I appreciate the, the talks and the videos that are out there. And it's also just really informative to, you know, others of what is race. What yeah. is the definition of race versus what is the definition of ethnicity? Yeah, that's does, that's yeah. another video that's coming. I'm going to have one coming out on interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about the curse of Ham, which was the um, source of a, kind of a biblical argument for discrimination and prejudice for a long time in the American church. And we're just going to start tackling some of these very difficult issues. And um um, let's see if I can talk Monique into a few videos with me on uh, how to have some race conversations and yeah. some practical tips that we've learned in our friendship and and how to how to do these things in a good and constructive and uh, a loving way that truly reflects humility and patience and, and the character of Christ. Yeah, I think it's awesome. People will be able to learn from our experience and our mistakes. Yes. And God yes. knows there's been yeah. a lot of mistakes. Yes. <laughs> So, so well, go, uh, go, um, find Monique on Twitter. She needs some friends there. I do. I'm following three people and no one is following me. Oh no. Chris is following me. Yeah. That's it. Um, yeah. Find me on Twitter. I am the real Monique D that is me. And Krista is theology mom everywhere. Yeah. I think on Twitter, I'm like theology underline mom or something. Yeah. But theology underscore mom yeah. on Twitter. But everywhere, everywhere else, else is Theology, theology Mom. Mom. Theologymom.com. And subscribe to my podcast. I'm on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, also to my YouTube channel, and Facebook and Twitter. So all, right. all the things. All the things. Thank you so much for being with us. We yeah. appreciate it. We appreciate you. We appreciate your comments and questions. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, that's a wrap. Yeah. We love all of you. We love your, your comments and questions, like Monique said, and keep them coming. And uh, if you have any topics you'd like us to tackle, send them our way. We talk about God, the Bible, and all things life. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye. Bye, -bye. God bless. <laughs>